Three weeks ago, we met Nicodemus knocking at Jesus' door in the cover of night. The teacher who, despite the risk to his own reputation, just had to be a learner as well. The next week, we met the Samaritan woman at the well who encountered Jesus at high noon and who ran back into town and said, come and see, trying to get them to become disciples of Jesus, like a barker on a sideshow, trying to get people to come into the tent. And last week, we met that man born blind who had been given the unexpected gift of sight, and we left him kneeling at the feet of Jesus, lost in wonder, love, and praise. So this week, we meet Lazarus. Actually, that's not quite accurate, is it? Lazarus is the catalyst for this story, but not the main character. His illness and death set the stage for the action, but we don't actually know very much about him, do we? Frederick Buechner says that Lazarus is the only person in the Gospels who seems to have had no standing at all except as a friend of Jesus. He's not a disciple. He's not a religious authority. He's just Jesus' friend, somebody whom Jesus loves. Lazarus gets sick, and his sisters Martha and Mary are worried, so they send a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. We expect to read that Jesus drops everything and rushes to his side, but he doesn't. He waits two days before he begins the two-day trip to Bethany, and by the time he gets there, Lazarus is dead and buried and well on his way to becoming the dust to which we all shall return. John provides a theological reason for this delay. It is to provide another dramatic demonstration of Jesus' power and identity. No doubt John has good reasons for saying this, but I wonder if another explanation might be just as plausible. I know someone whose twin sister died of cancer right after their 25th birthday, the morning she died, he got a call from the hospital. It's close, the nurse said, you'd better come. So he jumped out of bed, and he could have dashed down, but he didn't. He took time, 10 minutes or so, to shave and shower. It was an absurd thing to do in the circumstances, and he's always regretted doing it, because by the time he got to the hospital, cleanly shaved and neatly dressed, his sister had died. They began life together, and he had the opportunity to be with her when her life ended, but he missed it. That was more than 40 years ago, and the only explanation he can come up with is that in some inexplicable way, he thought that if he delayed leaving just by 10 minutes, she would live 10 minutes longer. I am the person in that story. Of course, my behavior that morning was nonsensical, absurd, but countless times in my ordination, since my ordination, I have heard people say much the same thing. If only I hadn't had that second cup of coffee, we wouldn't have been late going to school, and I wouldn't have arrived at the intersection just when that guy ran the red light. If only I hadn't left the room for five minutes, she would not have died alone. If only I hadn't dozed off, I'd have been holding his hand. Maybe Jesus, despite his love for Lazarus, couldn't bear the prospect of looking into one more pair of desperate eyes. Or maybe he thought that if he waited a couple of days, Lazarus would be okay. 
whatever the case, by the time he does get there, Lazarus is dead, and Martha and Mary are in no mood to mince words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha says it first, and then Mary says exactly the same thing. A fine friend you turned out to be. A fine Messiah, too. Our brother was dying, and you didn't come. What good is it to be a nighttime Bible teacher, or to heal blind men, or to chat with Samaritan women if you don't come when your own friend needs you? Grief has a way of getting straight to the heart of the matter. The stories in John's Gospel operate on several levels at the same time. There is no one way to read this story, but I hear this. Jesus asks, where have you laid him? And Martha and Mary respond, come and see. What brings on those tears? Jesus begins to weep. I think it is these words, come and see, because in John's gospel, these words are a formula for people to be invited to become disciples of Jesus. Two inquirers ask, where are you stay staying, teacher? And Jesus responds, come and see. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asks Philip, come and see, Philip replies. Come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done, says the woman at the well. Where have you laid him? Come and see. I think that in this moment, Jesus is himself being called to become a disciple. He's being called to look at his own death, his own grave clothes, to see the heavy stone rolled across the door of his own tomb, to smell the stench of his own decaying flesh. I think that he hears from the lips of Martha and Mary an invitation to die for his friend Lazarus to take his place. And more than that, he hears the call within his own divine and human heart to die for the whole world. And Jesus began to weep. He weeps for himself and what he is about to encounter in Jerusalem. He weeps for the friends who are about to desert him, for the crowds that will call for his death upon the cross. He weeps for the pain of the nails which will be driven into his flesh and for the deeper pain of feeling forsaken by everybody, including God. Jesus begins to weep, and he weeps even now for brothers who magically think that a 10-minute delay will keep their sisters from dying, or for sisters who die without them he weeps for the children of Mosul, caught up in a merciless war. He weeps for children abandoned because of their parents' opioid addiction. He weeps for you and me because we feel so lost, because we are so lost without him. He weeps for love of us, his friends, and for himself, and what he must do to show his love for us. In John's Gospel, Jesus is called the Lamb of God, and his death takes place at the precise moment when the sacrificial lamb is offered for Passover in the temple. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Some Christians have taken this to mean that Jesus is somehow the victim of God's own lust for punishment. He is the sacrifice in the sense that he is the victim of God's divine justice. 
Uh, I suppose that at one time this way of looking at Jesus' death was useful. Now I think it distorts the gospel. Jesus is a sacrifice in the sense that he runs toward and not away from the burning towers of our sin and our need. He enters our lives. He climbs the stairs. He knows what he is doing. He puts his life on the line. We learned from 9-11 what sacrifice looks like. Sacrifice wears a firefighter's hat, a policeman's cap, a crown of thorns. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God stands by the grave of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come out. The Lamb of God cries even louder, unbind him and let him go. And that has been Jesus' mission all along, to unbind us and to set us free. Lazarus has a temporary reprieve from death, but it will not last. To secure our resurrection to eternal life, Jesus will have to take his place, our place. He will have to don the crown of thorns, the purple cloak, the grave clothes Lazarus has discarded. He will have to drink the cup, which he could have declined if he had not loved us more than his own life. We are but two weeks away from Easter. Next Sunday, we will march into the church, waving our palm fronds and singing, Hosanna to the Son of David. Then we will hear the events that Jesus is seeing right now, standing at the grave of his friend Lazarus. The cries will change from Hosanna to crucify. The friends who pledged Loyalty to the death will scatter like so many frightened sheep. And we will hear, too, the story of how, knowing all of this would take place, Jesus still washed his disciples' feet, called them his friends, gave them bread and wine to drink and share in remembrance of him. Come and see the Lamb of God. Come and see the Savior of the world. Come and see the Christ who wept and died and lives to save you, to set you free, to save the world and set it free. Come and see. Let us pray. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our works, a continual thank offering to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>